muchas gracias a, a la UNI y a toda la gente que están aquí hoy. Uh, me, me llamo David Malan, enseño un curso, se llama CS50 en Harvard. Y si está bien, uh, hablo el inglés mejor que el español. Entonces, I'd like to speak more English here on out. Um, those of you who have taken CS50 online or watched some of the videos, know that I typically speak very fast like this in English, which is what Spanish currently sounds like to me. Um, so I will do my best to speak more slowly so that those of you with headsets uh, can follow along. So this is a talk and a story about CS50 at scale and al grande. And what I mean by this is that this map here represents where this course CS50 now exists. In red are dots where we have high schools. Uh, taking or teaching CS50 in some form. And in blue are dots where we have universities as well as of last year alone. And so CS50 at scale for us means uh, a big question. How do we go about um, bringing computer science to students beyond Cambridge? And how do we go about supporting students as well as teachers uh, here in Nicaragua, um, elsewhere in the United States, and really around the world? But before we do that, I thought I would give those of you who are unfamiliar with CS50 a glimpse of what it is. At the end of the day, CS50 is Harvard's introduction to the intellectual enterprises of computer science and the art of programming. It's an introduction to computer science. And the syllabus, the material we teach, I dare say is fairly common and is fairly traditional. But is very, what is very untraditional about CS50 uh, is how we approach the course's culture, how we approach the course's community, and where we emphasize students' experience beyond the material alone. And so this means in addition to teaching students computer science and in turn how to program, there is this whole experience that students have in Cambridge, in New Haven, uh, here now in Managua and beyond that involves puzzle days and CS50 hackathons and CS50 fairs as well as the office hours and sections and lectures wherein they learn that material. And if you've not yet taken CS50 or are considering doing so here with our friends Carlos and Silvio and all of the teaching fellows already here, I thought I'd give you a glimpse at what this experience can be like through the lens of Harvard University.
if you don't recognize him, that's, uh, that's, sure. <laughs> That video is thanks to CS50's production team, who is expert in video back home. And if you don't recognize him, that man was Steve Ballmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, who joined us two years ago for a guest lecture. So I've been teaching CS50 for 10 years now, and I've been alive for 40, <laughs> apparently, now. And um, over those 10 years, when I inherited the course, one of the most important things to do for me was to ensure that the course was accessible. Um, the course itself and CS computer science more generally, I dare say had a reputation of being a field to beware. Oh, that didn't fix it. Uh, there we go. A field to beware. And what I didn't want to do when taking over this course was simply make it easier or remove material from it, but rather to maintain the course's historical rigor and the course's historical workload, but to nonetheless make it more fun, more applicable, and to take what had previously been an on-ramp that might look like this, where we assume this much material at the beginning, and to lower the entry point for students without experience, those students less comfortable, but still ensuring that they end up just as successful and just as learned as students who had even studied the class before. And since then, have we applied the same idea really all around the world? In 2007 is, again, when I took over CS50 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2012, did the course become freely available on edX? If unfamiliar, this is a free platform online that you can take courses on um, for free and engage with students around the world. And the course, even since 2007, had been freely available as what MIT has called open courseware. All of the handouts, all of the videos, all of the problem sets, everything was freely available. But via edX now did we have an even larger community of students who were discovering computer science by way of our course and other courses from MIT and UC Berkeley and elsewhere. And then in 2015, we introduced another version of the class. It's very common after university uh, for some students to go to graduate school, for instance, in business studies, and receive an MBA, a degree in business. And we adapted CS50 to that particular audience. So there's a shorter version, a different version of CS50, that focuses on how you use technology to solve problems in business and how you go about thinking about cloud computing and security and the cost thereof. So whereas CS50 itself um, here in Managua and in Cambridge and Yale is very much bottom up. You learn by doing and you build things and you struggle through the building of those things. The MBA class is more of a top down discussion oriented class where you don't get your hands as dirty with programming, but you talk about topics and you better understand who the engineers you work with, uh, how, they, how they tend to operate. In 2015, we also uh, transitioned the class to Yale, another big university in the United States. And then in 2015, did we also roll out what we call CS50 AP. AP means advanced placement, which is a common program in some schools. And it's an opportunity for us to ad adapt the course to a high school audience Similarly, not changing expectations, not making it easier, not making it lighter, but with that demographic, allowing students more time. Whereas at Harvard and Yale, uh, we might typically have a 12-week semester, so you have only 12 weeks to do all of the work. At the high school level, they typically have as many as 36 weeks, but it's the same work, it's the same tools, it's the same experience, but it ensures that students, even without experience, can be successful in the end. And in terms of some numbers, if curious, at Harvard, uh, we happen to be the largest course these days with undergraduates and graduate students, about 700 students each semester in the fall. We have about 150 students at Yale, and then 300 students through Harvard's Extension School, which is continuing education, a program for adults or for students who aren't in university themselves. Um, at the MBA program, we have 100 students or so each semester. And with CS50X, it's, it's a lot of people. Um, not all of them engage actively. They might sign up and come and go, but it's over one million registrants these days have found the course via edX. And we now have, most excitingly, not just students all around the world, but support structures, much what like Silvio and Carlos are doing here. Do we have in Bolivia and Miami and Rhode Island and St. Louis in the US? Um, <laughs> Bolivia not being in the US, Kansas City in the US, Burma, Chile, Netherlands, Nicaragua now, of course, the UK um, and uh, Ukraine 
and beyond. And so these are just some of the folks that you saw depicted graphically with the map just a little bit ago. And then in CS50AP this coming year, where we likely have as many as 300 teachers, 300 high schools or colegios um, teaching CS50 in some form with over 6,000 students as well. So what is CS50, particularly if you've not yet experienced it through the opportunity here or online. So this is what Sanders Theater looks like at Harvard. We're fortunate to have such a beautiful space to fit all of these students and it's here that uh, Scully and Ramon and our production team back home actually captures the course's material. Um, we don't just shoot the lectures once. Every year we refresh the course and bring in new topics and bring in new news that might have happened in industry and ultimately create an ongoing opportunity for students to learn conceptually what computer science is and how to program. But there's a whole support structure too. This is a glimpse of a space that looks a little like Hogwarts, but is really a dining hall where a lot of the first years eat, but also at night do we use spaces like this to bring students together. And this too is a remarkable thing. As opposed to just having study halls or fairly traditional classrooms, we actually bring students to non-conventional places on campus like the dining hall here or other places on campus where there might be food and there might be friends, but the goal really is to have students rubbing shoulders with each other from different fields, working on their computer science homework or some other topic altogether. And here is, if curious, our friends at Yale down the road. But then in terms of the communities, and this is really what's made CS50 at scale so special, these are some of our friends here in Miami-Dade. Uh, who, one of whom actually on the left here, Arturo Real, is from Venezuela and was studying in Miami-Dade College, a large school in Florida in the U.S., and actually now works with us full-time in Cambridge as a result of having finished his studies there and taken CS50 in Miami. These are some of our friends here in Chile, and if you're familiar, you can see students, maybe like some of your own classmates, implementing bubble sort there up front. Uh, these are some of our friends in London. Here we have Burma. Here we have friends in Bolivia, and then, of course, uh, some of our own friends here. So you might see yourself up on the slide now as well. And in addition to these folks, do we have a whole community of teachers? This was one of our first group of high school teachers that adopted or adapted CS50 for their own classroom, and this was our first ever CS50 hackathon for high school students uh, in New York. Eight schools, four public schools, four private schools came together. Uh, for a Saturday afternoon to work on their problem sets, to work on their final projects, but ultimately um, working together and experiencing together a field that had otherwise been very unfamiliar to them. So what does it mean beyond all of the photographs and what is it, especially if you're considering computer science um, here or beyond, what is it you actually learn and what is it we actually do? So the syllabus itself is fairly uh, conventionally structured, um, but we cover quite a bit of material. Indeed, CS50 is what most schools would call CS1 plus CS2, all combined together in just one semester. And so we begin the semester introducing students first to programming and really computational thinking by way of a problem set uh, called Scratch. Um, and by way of ultimately a language called C, which is more cryptic, which is more traditional, but is a more powerful language still. And in that world, do we explore topics like arrays, and algorithms and data structures and memory management. And indeed, those of you taking CS50X right now are roughly at this point, I believe, in the semester. And what then comes next? Well, we transition from that to really web programming, more modern incarnations of computer science and programming, looking at HTTP and the web and web programming more generally, and also at topics like machine learning. All the rage these days with Uber and other companies is the idea of self-driving cars and the implications of that and the technology behind that. And so did we introduce this topic, thanks to our friends at Yale, for the very first time. And then at the end of the semester, do we move away from C altogether and introduce students to a bit of Python and SQL and JavaScript. These are just different programming languages, if not familiar. But the goal is so that when students take a class like CS50 and exit it, they don't say, I learned C one specific programming language. Rather, they say, I learned computer science, but more specifically in programming, I learned how to program with procedural or imperative languages, for those familiar. But what is the structure of the class then? In Cambridge and in New at Harvard and Yale, it's 12 weeks, though this is different based on the various geographies and where students take the class. At Harvard, there's eight homeworks, or nine homeworks, uh, one exam, one quiz, and one final project, the last of which is the most impactful. It's an opportunity for students 
without being told by us what to do, it's an opportunity for them to design and implement a project of their very own. But it's really in terms of the course's problem sets that students have the most challenges and learn the most. It's one thing to just listen to someone like me speak or even attend section or office hours. Most of students' time is spent on these problem sets, estas tareas, and they cover very domain inspired or specific problems. Um, in Scratch, for instance, this is a graphical programming language where you can drag and drop puzzle pieces on the screen that lock together and then make characters on the screen animate. In C, then, do we implement, uh, if you're familiar with Super Mario Brothers, a little something like Super Mario Brothers Pyramid, using a very simple language uh, with which most students are not yet familiar. But then we very quickly transition to topics like cryptography. And those who might know, what, what is cryptography? Hiding information. So if you want to send a secret message to a friend in class, you could just write it in English or Spanish. But if the teacher intercepts it, he or she, of course, will know what you're talking about. So maybe instead of doing that, you change all of your letters. A becomes B. B becomes C. Or something more sophisticated than that, that might be encryption, encoding the information in some way. So we have students for this homework assignment actually implement a program that encrypts and decrypts information. And for the more comfortable students in the class, and this is a key detail too, we traditionally have different tracks within the class. A track for students less comfortable and students more comfortable, and then students somewhere in between, each of whom can decide whether to do the less comfortable or the more comfortable homework assignments that are equally weighted, just as important as each other. But in this case too, we might give students a bunch of passwords from an actual computer system that are encrypted or technically hashed in some way. And they have to write software that cracks those passwords, figures out what they are by writing software that kind of guesses intelligently. Well, maybe it's a word in a dictionary. Maybe it's a birth date. Maybe it's something that's very common. And the goal is to crack those passwords as quickly as possible. Game of 15, we give students code for the very first time, several 100 or more lines of code that they have to first read and understand and then add to. So you're not always starting with an empty window. Uh, forensics, one of my favorite. Typically, we'll walk around campus uh, taking digital photos of people, places, or things. And then every year, I accidentally delete the photos from my, my phone or from my camera. And so we make what's called a forensic image of the data, just copy all of the zeros and ones off of the device and into a file, give students that file, and then they have to write software to recover all of the photographs from that file, hopefully recovering all of the photographs that I myself lost. Thereafter, do we implement uh, misspellings? So here, we challenge students not just to write correct code, but to write good code, efficient code, that isn't necessarily theoretically good, but actually good in terms of performance. We give students a big file of 150,000 words, so a really big file, and they have to implement a spell checker. But data structures underneath the hood that implement a spell checker as quickly as possible. And we measure how much time they use on the CPU, the brains of the computer, and we measure how much RAM or memory they use to actually run their code. And then we have a, a leaderboard, a ranking, if students opt in, where you can see how you're doing compared to your friends in terms of minimizing just how much memory and CPU time you might be using. And then lastly, do we transition to web programming and Python in particular? We introduced for the first time this past year uh, something called sentiment analysis uh, in the area of uh, artificial intelligence, where at the time, it was funny at the time, uh, we wrote code, or we had students write code, to analyze the sentiment of tweets. So we wanted students to determine if you write a tweet with your program, is it a positive, like a happy tweet, or is it negative, or a mean, or angry tweet, so green or red, for instance. And we encouraged students at the time to, for instance, uh, analyze maybe a certain Donald Trump's tweets to see just how red or red they might be, and Hillary Clinton and some of the other candidates at the time. And this, we gave them a really big file of positive words and a really big file of negative words that humans generally think of as positive versus negative, beautiful versus ugly, hot versus cold, or something like that. They're, they're uh, opposite type words so that they could then analyze the data. And then CS50 Finance. We have students write code 
and build a web application using Python and using SQL, a database language, via which they implement the notion of buying and selling stocks. They write code that gives all of their users an imaginary uh, uh, 10,000 US dollars, for instance. And they can then invest that money by buying or selling stocks and talking to Yahoo Finance, which provides, for instance, nearly real-time stock quotes. And so you have your own website that simulates what it is to work in finance or be an investor yourself. And then lastly, Mashup, for instance, a website that uses JavaScript, yet another language, has students implement a map using Google Maps and their API, so to speak, their free software, so that you can click and drag and navigate news articles based on different cities or countries around the world. So what is the course itself um, structured as and what does, where might you see yourselves in this picture? So in Cambridge over the past 10 plus years has enrollment looked like this. Computer science is there say uh, very popular right now. When I inherited the course back then we started the year prior with maybe 100 students give or take and we're now up to 700 or so students every semester. So there's been this big influx of students and interest, but simultaneously has there been a big uh, investment and a big influx on our part of support. For the 700 students we have at Harvard, for instance, we have nearly 80 teaching fellows or course assistants, 8-0, who themselves are almost entirely students. And this too is one of the unusual aspects of CS50. It's not just 40 year olds like me teaching CS50, it's undergraduates. It's students who took the class just one year ago who therefore are more comfortable than they used to be with the material and they lead the sections and they lead the office hours and they ultimately teach their own classmates. What's been interesting too to see is this. This is a lot of numbers and colors, but in blue are students less comfortable. In orange are students more comfortable. In red are somewhere in between. And so what this means is that in 2008, about 34% of the class describe themselves as less comfortable. Now, they're a majority of the class composing 62%, twice as many students, essentially. And so this, too, has required that we adjust the course's support structure so that those students with less experience and less comfort aren't dropping the class, aren't struggling more than they need to. And it's absolutely the case that for those less comfortable, less experienced students, the course will absolutely take a lot of time. And it might take them more time, even twice as much time. But the key ingredient and design principle underlying CS50 is that all students, irrespective of their background, should be able to succeed, given the right resources and given the right amount of time. And here's just a glimpse then, for instance, of the teaching team we have at Harvard teaching CS50 last fall. And almost all of the faces pictured here were themselves students who took the class one or two or three years prior. What does the course itself look like? It has lectures once a week in a place like Sanders Theater or on video for students to watch. Sections, which are smaller classes with 10, 20, 30 students and one teaching fellow reviewing material, answering questions, and doing what we couldn't really do in a space as large as this together. And then office hours. And this too is a key detail. We have a space on campus, much like the space you have here with all of the photographs on the wall, where students can go for help really throughout the week. At almost any hour at Harvard, can students drop in on a space, meet some of their classmates, and meet some of the teaching fellows, and ultimately learn, uh, get their questions answered on some homework assignments. And if you're curious, and if you're in CS50 now, and you've been struggling, or maybe you were in CS50 and struggled and thought, wow, this isn't for me, because look at how much time it's taking. I mean, here at Harvard, these lines represent the average number of hours students tend to take on each of the problem sets. The horizontal line here means it was about six hours for problems at zero for scratch. And that's about right if you get into it and might have some struggles. But then certainly later in the semester, the average is closer to 12 or 15 hours. Um, and that's important to note because it's very normal and it's very usual for students to take a lot of time. And indeed, even myself, I don't consider myself a fast programmer. I don't know if I consider myself a great programmer. I just know that if I do put in the time, and I sort of take things step by step and methodically, I will always find the solution. And that honestly has been very empowering, if not challenging in computer science and in programming specifically, at least at this level when you're just learning material and you're learning what others before you have discovered already. And that's, of course, the even harder part 
there's always an answer. There's always a way to get your code correct. You just need to find it. You just need to see it. And it's very gratifying when you finally do. But of course, it's not just all this kind of work. As some of you have experienced, CS50 is characterized by these cultural aspects, these experiences that, frankly, most classes don't really have. CS50 Puzzle Day is an opportunity at the start of the year for students to get together and not work on code, not even use computers necessarily, but to solve problems, puzzles, riddles, and word problems, really to send the message that computer science is about problem solving. It is not programming, even though one of the things you'll spend most of your time on in an introductory class is programming. It's just a tool that you use to solve problems and think about problems. Here is CS50 Puzzle Day in Cambridge. Here is CS50 Puzzle Day in Nicaragua. Uh, here is a recent lunch um, and in CS50 back home. This is purely social. Like once a week do we get together with 50 or so students just to chat and just to talk about maybe the course, but probably more likely what else they do at school or what you can do after class, what you can do in industry. And we invite alumni and friends from local companies to join us for lunch just to chat with students about why they're taking a class like this in the first place and how it applies to the real world. The CS50 Hackathon, we started some years ago. We borrowed the idea from our friends at Facebook. And the hackathon, in our case, is a 12-hour uh, opportunity from 7 PM at night to 7 AM in the morning to just work on your final projects. But more than that, have this shared experience with friends and with classmates, all of whom might be struggling with similar things and going through it together. Um, to be fair, staying up quite uh, all night is a challenge unto itself. But in our case, we serve uh, pizza at 9 PM, usually Chinese food at 1 AM. And then as you may have seen from the video, there's this place in the US called the International House of Pancakes, or IHOP, which is not really international in any sense. But we go there. We drive there at 5 AM with anyone who's still awake at that hour. But of course, not everyone makes it. This was 4 AM one year, for instance. But by far, one of the most exciting things and one of the exciting goals of the class is something like this, our CS50 Fair. And it didn't start this big. It was certainly much smaller in its first year. But it's grown to be an event every year with 2,000 or more people coming to see students' final projects and to see what you can do with computer science. And indeed, most of the students who take CS50 at Harvard, they're not computer science students. They're not going to major in computer science. 90% of them are studying some other field, economics, uh, social sciences, natural sciences, medicine, the arts. And for instance, I grabbed a few photos and names from this past year. Two students named Lyra and Sarah implemented an app called AudioChrome. And this was an app, I mentioned this to some of the TFs yesterday, where if you're colorblind, you can't see colors properly with your eyes, but you do have a phone, you can point your phone at something and, and decide just what color these flowers are. Or more compellingly, when getting dressed in the morning, you know, do these pants match this shirt or this tie? Because the phone can answer questions that you yourself might not be able to. And they implemented software for iPhone that did exactly that. Nick, for instance, is a musician. And he can read sheet music on paper or on the screen. And he wrote software that converted musical notes on scales like this to actual computer a readable data so that it could then be synthesized by the computer even though it had started in this form using something called optical character recognition, letting the computer and machine vision, so to speak, figure out what those notes represent. Uh, Lucas here uh, was using uh, Amazon Alexa, I believe, here. He's talking into it on the right-hand side there. And it was connected to his computer because Alexa, like Google Home and a lot of these new devices that are voice activated, have APIs, application programming interfaces, via which you can teach them to do new things and do projects that are of interest to you, not just what Amazon or Google or other companies decide you should have in your home. Um, Jeanette, Ken, and Mary here implemented something called Drop the Ramen. Uh, at least in the US, it's very common for college students to eat a lot of ramen or dried noodles uh, uh, at, uh, late at night, for instance. And they wrote an app that makes it a lot easier for students to figure out healthier meals to make using the limited ingredients they might actually have. And then this one, too. I didn't even know before meeting Luke 
at Yale uh, a year ago that this data was collected, but it turns out in the NBA, uh, the Basketball Association, and in a lot of sports, they collect a huge amount of data now. For instance, if you like shoot a shot in a basketball court, they very often use computers to record where that shot was taken physically on the floor, who took it, did it actually go into the net or not. And so Luke used this data and actually made a vi visualization here, for instance, of LeBron James actually depicting where in green he made shots, where in red he missed shots, thereby merging the ideas of visual visualization and programming to actually do something that can help you, the athlete, perhaps make better sense of where you're good. Apparently layups are pretty easy, so there's a lot of green over here. And it's not necessarily clear if there is a pattern elsewhere, but perhaps there is and you can get better at what it is you do as a result. Um, and you see ultimately at the CS50 Fair faces like these and faces of your own classmates hopefully delighting in the kind of projects that have been implemented. And that too is ultimately one of the goals, to actually be proud of something you do and not just do homework week after week, but to build something that's ultimately your own. Now in CS50X, from which CS50X Nicaragua is derivative of course, it is exactly the same curriculum, it is exactly the same tools, and ideally it's exactly the same experience. We don't have the luxury of being in the same physical place, but do we have opportunities for our students online to have puzzle day experiences and fairs online and to meet locally with students much like is happening here. We typically stretch that version of the class freely available through edX over 52 weeks, a full year. And the workload is ultimately almost the same, the nine homework assignments and the final project, but not, for instance, the exam, simply because most students taking the course through edX are really doing it just for their own interest and edification, and there's not that same need for rigor. But for those students, do we have huge communities online? You might recognize some of these websites here, certainly Facebook and Twitter, but also Reddit and Stack Exchange um, and others still, Slack nowadays too, where right now, if I um, went into CS50's Facebook group, and you guys have your own here for CS50X Nicaragua, within minutes typically, if I post a question in that community with some 100,000 Facebook users, do you get an answer? And you might actually be able to connect with them and see students around the world. And this has been one of the most impactful things by far, how students across the world who wouldn't otherwise necessarily have need or opportunity to meet each other or talk about something coming together to share in some experience and ultimately learn some topic. At Yale, meanwhile, this has been one of our uh, most tight-knit relationships. Um, historically, Harvard and Yale are kind of competitors, and we are single-handedly trying to solve 300 years of strife. Uh, but in this case, do we have students taking the same course at both Harvard and Yale? And most importantly, do we have undergraduate teaching fellows teaching the class on both campuses? And this was the proverbial chicken and the egg problem at first. If CS50 is mostly taught, not just by me, but by our undergraduate teaching fellows, or course assistants as we call them, well, it's kind of hard to do that at Yale if no one at Yale has ever taken CS50. And so we spent quite a bit of time the previous year training students, having them do the course's problem sets on their own, and ultimately bootstrapping, so to speak, a tr support structure so that now they are on their way to functioning exactly as we have in Cambridge. And indeed, this was one of the events where we first uh, recruited students to teach. And indeed, one of the most remarkable things here is, too, the idea of undergraduate students, students in university, teaching other students in university is sometimes controversial. Even at Harvard, most departments do not allow this. And the reality was at Yale, as a result of CS50 being taught there, Yale University, after 200 years, now allows undergraduates to teach other undergraduates in roles like this. And this is now something they're rolling out to other computer science courses at Yale as well. And so this was our first cohort of Yale students uh, just over a year ago. And this was their CS50 fair. They too have a very Hogwarts-like space as well. Now if curious, CS50 for MBAs is different. It focuses not so much on that same broad community and focuses not so much on that hands-on building of, of software, but it focuses on ideas, cloud computing, programming languages in general, database design, computational thinking, a lot of the ingredients that a computer scientist and engineer ultimately learns in courses about computer science, but that's because he or she in a course like CS50 itself is going to use those skills themselves. But it's incredibly and increasingly important in business or in politics or in any number of fields just to understand what is the cloud, right? Odds are everyone in this room has heard of the cloud, but if I may, what is the cloud? 
What is the cloud? Yes. It's a virtual space and many servers spread across the world where people store information. You can access it from anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Virtual space anywhere in the world. Servers that you can use anywhere in the world. But at the end of the day, frankly, this in so many terms really are just uh, marketing phrases to describe more interesting technologies. In this case, the cloud is really just about using someone else's servers. And this has been possible for decades, but once you put a nice little icon on it and you call it iCloud and the like, you have what seems to be a whole new technology that you're not necessarily keeping up with. But the reality is the underlying technologies are largely invariant. And so with our MBA and our business students, do we help them try to sift through what is meaningful, what are just buzzwords or expressions so that they can make better decisions ultimately and actually know what the cloud, so to speak, offers in terms of actually solving business problems or costs that they might have. And then lastly, the last flavor of CS50 at scale now is this, CS50 AP, or Advanced Placement, which is just an adaptation of the course for high schools using the same curriculum, the same technologies, but spread over typically 36 weeks, give or take, uh, with what are required by the AP College Board. Uh, the College Board is a group that essentially decrees how you standardize tests. And so in AP, a CS50 AP, there's not just the problem sets, there's performance tasks and an exam that's required uh, for AP credit, but this is really just an implementation detail. What's important with CS50 AP, that in 2015, it represented a significant change on our part. For many years, had we focused almost entirely on students, providing students with freely available resources and homework assignments and tools and, and sample solutions and the like, but we didn't really focus at all on teachers and sort of uplifting teachers to be more comfortable themselves so that we could achieve ultimately more of a network effect, more of an exponentiation. We've never thought it's interesting, frankly, in CS50 that we have like one million students who've registered for for edX or for CS50X. I don't think we can do an especially good job teaching on our own 100,000 or 200,000 people at that kind of scale. Far more important is to have people locally supporting students and answering questions and creating those local communities. And this is exactly by way of these resources what we now provide to our teachers, um, both at the university level, but also and initially at the high school level, so that they have absolutely as much as they need and so that they don't, as in the US, need to just adopt curricula that come from textbook companies, for instance, who have traditionally decreed what a class would be like but teachers can now use this as a menu of options. We also provide our teachers with CS50 Puzzle Day in a box, and the hackathon in the box, and the fair in the box, so boxes of just swag and fun things and the puzzles themselves so that teachers can run these events at their own places. So ultimately, and we were chatting a few of us about this just a little bit ago, there's really three characteristics that characterize CS50 at Harvard and also CS50 at scale. It's that first and foremost accessibility, trying to create an educational experience at which any student can succeed irrespective of his or her prior experience in CS or not, changing that slope, so to speak, that on-ramp, but maintaining ultimately the rigor that the course and the field itself has long had. It's very easy, I dare say, to make a popular very large class by just lowering your expectations and making it easier and making it fun but really watering it down. But what's so I think impactful about a more rigorous introduction is that of all the classes that you might have had and frankly of all the classes I might have had, it's those where I put in the most time and struggle the most and yet somehow still like the most that I feel in retrospect, wow, like that was worthwhile. I might not want to take four of those classes a semester or more classes a semester but among those defining educational experiences you have, whether it's in CS or any other field, the ones that you're really proud of what you achieve at the end. And indeed, I thought I would end with just this visual, um, one of the aspects of which we are ourselves so proud, you'll recognize some familiar faces here. Um, it's been such an honor to be here today and yesterday and tomorrow. Um, and so thank you all to Carlos and Silvio and all of our hosts here today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but this then was CS50. How did we overcome the initial hesitation of the school to allow undergraduates? Thankfully at Harvard, someone else did this 40 years ago. So Harvard had thankfully had this tradition for a long time. At Yale, 
it was, I think, more challenging. Their entire faculty at the college had to vote on this opportunity. And honestly, strategically, I think it was well positioned as an experiment. And indeed, we framed this whole collaboration with Yale as an experiment. Three years, being scientists, we like to collect data and analyze. And I think creating those kinds of safe spaces where you're not proposing to change 100 years of history at Harvard or Yale or here or elsewhere. You're really just trying to try something new. You're scoping it in a way that if it fails, it's not a huge failure and it's not all that impactful. But you also don't create this sort of knee-jerk reaction that some folks have by saying no to something just because it's new. So I think framing it as an experiment and defining for yourself like what will it mean for this to be successful or not, I think is something that academics can hopefully get, um, get, get comfortable with much more readily. Any other questions, please? Grade school. Um, we're not sure of what, how quickly that would happen. We do already have, beyond high school, we've estimated that age 13 or 14 or 15 is reasonable to begin. We have counterexamples to this. Just yesterday on CS50's Facebook group, I posted a video of um, uh, a young lady who's 11 years old, Presley, who's actually been taking CS50 for some time. Um, but we're now only beginning to think about how we might create, not CS50 per se, but entry points to, to uh, computer science for younger kids. Is the basic language a barrier in Spanish, et cetera? Uh, not, it, it depends on the community thus far. Um, the, the team here has done an extraordinary job at translating the most important materials. For instance, the problem sets or subtitles on the English lectures. This is something we in Cambridge now are going to start focusing more on now that we've identified some very, we have critical mass among certain cultures or certain languages so that we can start helping um, with this as well. With that said, in the world of programming at least, which CS50 has a lot of, the reality is the languages and the communities online are so largely English driven. It's not a bad thing necessarily, but certainly for students for whom the, the world is so new, I think it's best that I'm not speaking entirely in English, but they can be more comfortable with that and then focus on um, the more technical stuff in, in English. Yes, in back. Absolutely. Can you be part of the class? Can you take it independent of a formal structure here or some other university? Absolutely. The easiest way is just to sign up for free on cs50.edx.org to identify the friends or classmates here or elsewhere in the world that you want to do it with and just come up with your own schedule. We propose that students take a few weeks per problem set through edX, but you can certainly do whatever you want. Um, so absolutely. And if you go to cs50.org, you'll see more information about how to stand up your own local community. And indeed, for instance, at University College London in the UK, we have a student group, the, the group of students who are interested in technology. They're just doing it on their own for fun and for their classmates. It's not a class per se. It's not for credit. But they're doing that at an even larger scale. Please. Not on scale yet. We've been chatting with some friends about doing this, and it has certainly happened organically with a few folks here and there. But we've just begun chatting with some of our larger friends in industry to do this, particularly because we have so many alumni in some of the larger tech companies in the world that we have that built-in support structure potentially among the volunteers there. So we're, we'll likely see that happen soon. Indeed. <laughs> oh, please. Something. Is there a further zone which is so saliente? I mean, people who execute what you expect them to execute, but propose something new? Definitely the latter. When, when we talk about comfort zones, less comfortable, more comfortable, and somewhere in between, we actually don't define this very precisely. The, the, the rule of thumb we offer to students is that if you're a little unsure why you're sitting in this room, if you've never really had an interest in computer science, you are, odds are, among those less comfortable. Doesn't mean you, you, do, uh, you don't do as well in school. It doesn't mean that you can't do the class. You're just a little out of your comfort zone, as so many students in CS50 are. The more comfortable students may very well be those kids who have been programming since they were six years old and for which it might be a lot of review. And so what we try to do 
is treat those demographics a little differently. They still get the same overarching experience, but we encourage the teaching fellows, for instance, in the more comfortable sections, talk about whatever you want. Ask the students where it is, what direction they want to go. But with the less comfortable students, most important is not even the material being covered, but the fact that and the rest of the students in that room are on the same page as them. And they're all sort of equally in that same boat. And that's the extent to which we characterize those comfort zones. It, well, the, the sort of end game and the reassurance we offer at the end of the semester, my email is almost always, not, you are, all of you are now more comfortable than you were previously. Um, and the reality is it doesn't mean we, nor, we equalize everyone and put everyone on the same footing just after three months or six months or the like, but that there's this delta. And hopefully the delta is somewhat invariant across those demographics. They're just going from one level to the next. Any final questions here? How do you get better at teaching? So I would say at least two, th uh, three things. Practice, first and foremost, but that's an easy one to say. Um, two is to observe. I mean, literally everything I did wrong today, remember, and don't do that again, <laughs> whatever that was in your mind. And I'm actually quite serious, because at least in college and high school, I certainly remember a few teachers who I thought were amazing, but I also remember a lot of teachers who were not very good. And I, that stuck with me, because it gave me kind of a roadmap of things not to do. Like, don't teach like this, talking at the board constantly while students are sort of zoning out. And it's somewhat easy things, but unless you keep those in mind, you yourself as a new teacher might fall into those same kinds of habits. So keep an eye out both for the good and for the bad. And then lastly, and thanks to technology, this is just getting easier and easier, record yourself. I mean, it can be a friend standing in the back of the room. You can get a little tripod or sort of a spider thing and just prop up your phone so that you can watch yourself after. The first year I taught, um, formally, some 20 or so years ago, every class was recorded, and I painfully watched back like two hours after class. It was on VHS tape at the time, so I could literally take the tape with me um, and give it to no one else, um, but I could watch the tape painfully afterward, and I eliminated lots of bad habits. I found myself saying the word et cetera a lot, or any time you say um or something like that, you start to hear it and notice it. And to this, uh, nowadays, I can't watch myself. It's just too painful. But initially, that really helps because you see yourself through others' eyes. And all three of those techniques, I think, really improve the odds of success in being in front of the class, too. Please. We, uh, we do. So how do we get, do we have ways of getting companies involved too? Many of the um, non-academic experiences we have in CS50, so to speak, like the hackathon and the CS50 fair and puzzle day, which aren't sort of core material that's graded, we can often reach out to friends in industry, sometimes new companies that we don't know anyone at. We just do a, a cold call or send an email to someone to see if they'd like to get involved, either with sponsorship, could you supply the pizza for this event, or could you uh, give us free copies of um, some piece of software for students to use for their final project or hardware can you send us uh, what we've we got could you send us uh, you know a Microsoft HoloLens for students to experiment with and so absolutely we have any number of ways to get companies involved so that we can do things that we couldn't otherwise do and we can provide students with tools and hardware that they might not otherwise have access to perhaps not even for years here Uh, can you say it again? What? Yeah, like how do you compare the role that this institution is playing to promote CS50 here with other institutions? I think with the consensus among our team, both over the past few months and even this week, has been. Um, the, the Fundacion Uno and the school are so much more involved, I think, than a lot of our collaborators, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. For instance, at U UCL, University College London, it's completely unofficial. The, the students there haven't really gotten the traction with the administration to give students credit, for instance, or to secure the beautiful spaces that you have around the corner here. Whereas here, it seems like there's a much more uh, cohesive collaboration among these various entities, students and, and faculty and foundation alike. So I think that 
that's huge to enabling um, the requisite support structure. Um, but some of these opportunities are just starting. And frankly, it's like um, the young lady's question in back, this is how exactly things begin. Um, in a nutshell, and I think you're already on your way to having one of the most robust opportunities for students to date. It's very comparable, for instance, to Miami-Dade College, where we had an extraordinary friend stand something up himself there as well. Yeah. The millennials are now fully fluent digital. The non-millennials are working way up the curve, less so. So uh, millennials are very comfortable with technology, uh, the latest technologies and apps, and perhaps as you're older, uh, less so. Um, I think it's been important for us to stay abreast of this. And I say this somewhat hypocritically, because uh, I'm told that Rick Rolls are not in vogue anymore, but you'll see throughout CS50 uh, such things as that, if you're familiar. Um, but yes, we have been very conscious of technology students are using, not just so that we have a presence there. I mean, we do have a CS50 Snapchat. We have Snapchat filters when we hold events, for instance, just for students to use for fun. But we also use these new trends and apps as opportunities for, for teaching teachable moments. Like we'll email our friends at Snapchat or some other company to come talk about how it is their app works. And when a message gets deleted, what does that mean, for instance? That would be an opportunity there. So I would say we tend to use the latest technologies and tools as an opportunity to really weave them into the fabric of the course. And I mentioned a HoloLens just a moment ago. That was a piece of hardware that a couple of our students actually used for their final projects after just three months of taking CS50. And we had similar explorations with VR, with Samsung Gear, and with HTC Vive and other such technologies. So we've stayed abreast of these, particularly to equip students with them, not as like a senior capstone project, but really as a first year introduction. Here. Here time for a couple more questions? Yeah. Tal vez, pero Christian aquí habla español muy bien. No, está bien. Oh. Es un poco más general. Este, bueno, tomando en cuenta su, su alto conocimiento en materia de tecnología, eh, mi pregunta es la siguiente: ¿Cree usted, eh, tomando en cuenta que estamos en un mundo tan globalizado, inevitablemente la tecnología forma parte de nuestro diario vivir? Vemos tecnología, comemos tecnología, nos rodea la tecnología. Entonces, eh, ¿cree usted que utilizar la tecnología? Eh, en pro de la educación, que es algo totalmente eh, eh, actual, ¿cree usted que eso es la principal arma que puede mejorar la educación en nuestros países latinoamericanos? Tomando en cuenta que en comparación con los países, o Estados Unidos, o los países europeos, pues eh, lamentablemente el, el nivel de educación, la calidad, pues no es tan, tan, tan alta como, o sea, eh, no es tan alta como, como ese tipo de país, entonces cree usted que la tecnología es la principal arma para mejorar eso. Let's hope Christian has good memory. <laughs> so in today's world, technology is being so present everywhere. Do you, see, uh, do you see technology as the main tool for improving education? Um, and are there any differences between uh, the US and here? But how is technology the right tool? Good, good. Buena pregunta. Um, so I think it's enabling. I, I certainly don't think technology is the solution to educational problems. And I, I remember back when I was a, a younger student in, in middle school where they were giving every student in the school a laptop just because. And it was as though that the mere introduction of technology, in that case laptops back in the day, was somehow going to improve their experience. But what they failed to do, and even years later when I taught high school, I taught high school math, and every classroom in my school had a computer, they didn't teach any of the teachers what to do with it. They didn't provide them with the training. They didn't provide them with useful, compelling pieces of software. Um, and I think that's what's key. I mean, what's more, far more important is the human factor. Factor. Um, and you're seeing it again these days, schools having iPads for everyone, for instance, especially at younger levels. But unless you have the right software and you have the right use cases in mind, I don't think that technology alone is the solution. It's simply facilitating what, uh, if enabling humans to do a better job in, for instance, the classroom. 
Uh, maybe two questions more uh, over here. De nada. A really good question. After taking CS50, what would be the next class to take? Um, we were just having this conversation, some of us, earlier. CS50 itself is in the process of beginning to create follow-on materials that are more technical, are more uh, technology specific. We're not there yet, but there soon will be those opportunities that you'll see within uh, edX and elsewhere online. But for now, it is a wonderful thing that Coursera and edX and Udacity and not to mention YouTube and iTunes University, there are so many places to get high quality educational content. I'll often point students to a algorithms and data structures class from Princeton, which is freely available on, uh, on Coursera from some colleagues there. Um, and beyond that, I would encourage you to find courses that are of interest to you. If you like um, software engineering and maybe iPhone programming or Android, Stanford, for instance, is how I learned iPhone programming years ago. They had a freely available course that was very popular. And so I just reached out um, to that course for free. So I would decide based on what you see in the menu on these various websites, what might interest you. And to your, suggest your classmate's suggestion earlier, like find a friend or a set of friends to perhaps do it with you, because I think that only improves the probability if you sort of put some pressure on each other and help answer questions for each other succeeding in the end. Have we identified any? Prodigies. Oh, prodigies. I don't, Presley, the 11 year old, has a very good start on uh, some of the students thus far. So we have to some extent. I mean, we have a fellow um, whose name is uh, Kareem, who lives in Cairo, Egypt, who kind of came on our radar thanks to Facebook and Stack Exchange, all, both of where he was very active. Um, and actually, he has a, a visa appointment in just a few days with the embassy there. And then hopefully next week, he'll be moving to Cambridge, Massachusetts to join us full time. Arturo Real, who I mentioned earlier from Venezuela and Miami, he joined us about a year ago. Uh, Christian here, who's been helping out, came from Guatemala and wanted to actually uh, stand up his own local opportunity for students. And we kind of stole him away for a year to come to Cambridge as well. We are. We are. And to that same point of integration, nowadays when we have a CS50 fair at Harvard or at Yale, we invite hundreds of our CS50 AP high school students to come to those events so that hopefully it's an opportunity for a bit of inspiration. And hopefully it's, an it's an all the more opportunities for our, college, our university students to talk with those younger students who are genuinely interested in what it is they have done. Well, allow me to officially adjourn here, but I'm happy to stick around with the whole team for additional questions. But it's been such an honor. Un placer. Muchas gracias.